Initiative, Priscilla Chan. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here with you today talking about some of the most important work in the world. A good education can change a kid's life. I know because it changed mine. My parents came to this country as refugees from Vietnam. They had almost no English skills or money. Growing up, my first job at age six was translating for my family. As a teenager, I'd work at the front desk of the restaurant they'd eventually open. Always, always, I knew I was an outsider. I was bullied. I worried constantly that my family might not have enough money to get by. But in so many ways, I was so fortunate. I could see a doctor when I got sick. I went to good public schools. I had my mentors, Mr. Long and Mr. Swanson, who really cared about me and showed me that I could succeed in the class, on the tennis courts, in the robotics club. When they first came to this country, my parents could not have possibly imagined that I would go to Harvard one day, much less end up on a stage here today with you. And I've never stopped feeling lucky, because my story is the exception not the rule. To work in education is to be confronted every day by the fact that so many kids will never have a fair shot in life, not even close. We are all here because we want to change that. And I'm here because I want to do my part. At the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, or CZI as we call it, our education work is focused on ensuring that every student, not just the lucky few, get the education that they need to reach their full potential. We believe that this starts by taking a whole child approach to learning. In short, expand the definition of student success beyond academics to include a student's physical, mental, social, and emotional needs as well. We believe that this must be informed by the science of learning, what we know about how students learn. We've been so inspired by the educators, researchers, engineers, social workers, doctors, and others who've been on the front line of this work for decades, who's told us why they believe in these approaches too. But first, I want to tell you about why I believe in it. When I was in college, I was a tutor in a low-income housing project called Franklin Hill in a town right next to where I grew up. I saw myself in those elementary school kids. They didn't have a lot, and you could tell they felt different, apart. And they were outsiders just like me. Excuse me. <coughs> but they didn't have the kind of support that I did. Despite their smarts, their spark, their resilience, they didn't have teachers recommending them for special programs or telling them that they were headed for college. I wanted to make sure that these kids had someone in their corner. I wanted to be that person. One day, one of the girls I tutored had missed school for several days so I tracked her down to ask her about it. Where have you been? I asked. She opened her mouth to speak, and I saw. Her two front teeth had been knocked out. My heart sank. I had gotten it all wrong. How could I focus on attendance and grades when I needed to focus on safety, maybe even survival? And more importantly, how could she? I thought, kids can't get the education they need unless they're healthy and safe. So I became a primary care pediatrician to be part of that solution. 
But once again, once I was on the front lines, I saw just how complicated the problems really were. During my ER shifts, parents would bring their kids in for routine care at 1 or 2 a.m. And I wondered, why? Then I realized that that was the only time when the parents weren't working. I remember seeing a young woman coming in with HIV system, symptoms, not well controlled. I asked her, why aren't you taking your treatment? Turns out, it wasn't because she didn't want to, but that every time she ran away from an abusive foster family, she lost access to her medical care. As a tutor, I was trained to see kids as students. As a doctor, I was trained to see them as patients. But I finally saw them that we needed a system that let me work with them as a whole person, people with complex, messy, deeply interconnected challenges. Because the truth is, the things that we think about as different aspects of child development, physical health, academics, mental health, social, emotional skills, they're actually inextricably linked. And when any of them are left unaddressed, the challenges start to compound. You can't learn multiplication tables if you're hungry, or if nobody's figured out that you can't see the board, or that if you feel so unsafe at home, you can't possibly raise your hand in class. Now, teachers have always known this to be true, but it can be tempting to shy away from it, or maybe just de-emphasize it, because confronting it means that we're responsible for entangling this incredibly complex web of challenges. And that's really hard, especially for teachers. I know, because as a former fourth and fifth grade science teacher, I've been there. Yet, when we design our systems around this whole child approach to learning, and we give teachers the support they need to really meet their children's needs, so that kids feel not only challenged, but safe and healthy and cared for, the results can be incredible. One study looked at what happens when at-risk kids get a mentor, someone see, who sees them not just as a student or a patient, but a whole person to support. Those students were 55% more likely to enroll in college and 130% more likely to have a leadership position. Another researcher looked at social-emotional skills, which are rarely prioritized in the classroom. <coughs> he, found, he found that those skills were 10 times more predictive of long-term achievement than academics. Again, these approaches are not new. Teachers have always known that kids don't learn in a vacuum, but they haven't been given the right tools to meet the challenges that they face every day. Pioneers like Maria Montessori understood and acted upon that knowledge, but in practice, the idea still remains somewhat revolutionary. <coughs> All of this got me asking, what if we based our schools and a better understanding of what actually helps kids learn? What if we invested just as much in every aspect of a child's development as we do in their academic progress? I decided to start a school like that in East Palo Alto, where more than 90% of students in the local school district receive free or reduced price lunch. At the primary school, teachers, parents, pediatricians, mental health professionals all work together to give the students the support that they need to thrive. That support extends, begins before kids even enter the classroom, and it extends to families who might be struggling to find housing or work or a way to put food on the table. It's just been three years since the school opened, and already we see how big of a difference a holistic approach can make. Let me just give you one example. Recently, there was a little girl at the primary school who always slept past nap time. She started having big emotional outbursts in the classroom. 
you, can, you may guess how this may typically play out. Discipline the child, email the parents, hope for the best. But at the primary school, the story played out a little differently. Teachers raised a flag, then a parent coach talked with the mother. It turned out they were experiencing homelessness, and the little girl didn't have a place to sleep at night. So the school stepped in. The little girl got additional time to rest, she got help expressing her emotions, and her mom got connected to housing and employment resources to help address the root problem. We don't sacrifice academic performance to do this. In fact, we're seeing this work drive even stronger academic results. In this program, kids are flourishing. Entire families are flourishing. Our hope is that, eventually, what we learn at the primary school will help other schools take on these approaches as well. But right now, for kids in East Palo Alto, getting into the primary school can feel like a stroke of luck. And that's not okay. We're working towards a world where every child gets an education that gives them a fair shot. Of course, we have a long road ahead of us. As you all know, the American education system was designed in the 1800s, before we knew much about child development. So it was one size fits all. Basically, we expect millions of children to learn in the same way, in the same pace, every day. Some kids, like me, get lucky and we do well in the system. Other kids get lucky and have parents who can find them a system that fits their needs better. But kids who aren't lucky, they struggle. So how do we change that? I think the medical field actually offers a lot of wisdom here. Like in education, the stakes are impossibly high, life or death. And in education, like in education, collaboration is tough. Researchers want exact clarity, and real life is complicated. Yet in medicine, the system ensures that advances in science make it into practice. But in education, those linkages are often flimsy or broken. In medicine, progress is never as fast as we want it to be, but over time, it accumulates. For so many diseases, it's easier to fight them now than it was even five or ten years ago. That's how much the field has advanced. How can we build a system that drives this type of progress in education? That's our mission at CZI. We see that mission as having two parts. First, we help further and fund learning and child development science. We're fortunate to have two world-renowned experts, Dr. Bror Saxberg and Dr. Brooke stafford Brizard, at CZI. They work to ensure that our work is informed by an understanding of how children and their brains develop and allow us to take a more holistic approach. In many ways, school know, schools know how much progress a student is making in reading and writing, which is critical. But sometimes those skills don't necessarily translate to success in college or the workforce. Cognitive skills like attention, memory, executive function, social-emotional skills like stress management, resilience, and the ability to develop healthy relationships. Those non-academic skills are critical too. That's why we're supporting researchers at Yale and Tufts who are helping us better understand how students build these skills from early childhood through adolescence. Second, we're working with schools and teachers to put research like this into practice and to help support new models that meets the needs of the whole child. The truth is, we haven't kept our schools up to date on best practices and techniques that really helps children learn. For example, it's pretty common for a student to complete a really big project and finish a unit without getting feedback until the class has entirely moved on. Research tells us that's not a great way to learn. A group of Maryland teachers we support work to develop NeuroTeach Global. It's an online tool that uses learning science principles like feedback and repetition to help teachers apply that science in their own classrooms and share that with teachers elsewhere. You've already heard me talk about the primary school. Another example of a model that's learning 
is Summit, the Summit Learning Program, which now operates in more than 400, close to 400 schools. Summit's goal is to empower teachers to better meet the needs of individual students. Every Summit Learning Classroom focuses on three key things, teaching through projects, developing lifelong learning skills, and cultivating deep relationships between students and their mentors. That last point is really important because there's a critique that because Summit uses software, we're looking to replace teachers. Really, though, the opposite is true. Summit places an enormous importance on that student-teacher relationship, and the software tool is just a way to strengthen it. We would never advocate for a world in which students sit alone at their computer screens and technology takes the place of a teacher. Nothing can ever take the place of a teacher. And the use of technology to support student learning must always be done in a way that protects privacy and security of their information. But let me share an example of how Summit really works. When Summit teachers were first starting out, they said it was really tough to mentor so many kids in the classroom. Every kid needed a check-in and, re and reminders, and it could be hard to remember where they left off the last time. That's when teachers asked engineers and child development experts for help. The result was a software tool that they built together. It helps teachers with ske to schedule reminders with mentor check-ins and let them track their notes. Teachers can quickly gauge where a student is at, where they're falling behind, where they're progressing, and give them feedback about where they're at. But don't take my word for it. Let's hear from some of the teachers in the program. Teaching in a traditional classroom, the challenges for me was meeting the needs of every learner. I never really got to know kids, and now in this Summit Learning program, I am able to mentor students. The engagement level is a huge difference from a traditional setting to a Summit Learning setting. It's a very different environment, and it's lively. It gives them the opportunity to be able to focus on things that they need more help on. They are learning how to advocate for themselves. They are learning to tell me what they need. I build way deeper relationships with my students. I'm able to like celebrate each student individually, and I love it. Like, did not get to do that before. I always get excited when I see that video. Uh, so although the program is still young and improving, the early results are promising. The Pasadena Independent School District in Texas started piloting the Summit Learning Program in 2015. In just two years, seventh graders who were the furthest behind their peers made a 17 percentage gain in the state math assessment and a 20 point gain in the reading assessment. I'm also excited to see what a new wave of education focused social entrepreneurs are bringing to the table here, and many of you are here today. Through our ventures work at CZI, for instance, we recently funded a company called Raise Me. Their model is focused on offering micro scholarships to reward and incentivize students and their behaviors that will get them into college and stay on track once they're there. About 40% of students on Raise Me are the first in their families to enter college. Through real-time feedback, mentoring, support, and guidance in the college admissions process, they're helping more students see how their work connects to their hopes for the future. Finally, there's another school that we work with called Valor Collegiate in Tennessee. Valor was founded by twin brothers, one an educator and the other a social worker. Pretty convenient, right? They came together to build a school that teaches social and emotional development as rigorously as academics. One way Valor does that is through exercises called circles. Circles happen once a week, and they're grounded in development science. They're a structured, facilitated way for kids to build deeper relationships with their peers and develop social-emotional skills. And for those of you who think this might be a little touchy-feely, the results speak for themselves. Valor schools rank in the top 5% of academic achievement in Tennessee, and Valor circles are now being used by more than 18,000 students nationwide. New approaches and models like these are almost always born of collaboration not just between twin brothers, but between people 
across the systems with questions and where they can discover new insights, test new ideas, like so many of you here today. I'm incredibly hopeful about what innovation can, we can achieve in education, but I'm also realistic. As you well know, this work is tough. We certainly don't have all the answers. Nothing is simple. Progress takes time. Straightforward successes are rare. And there's no shortage of critics for any approach taken. But those are not reasons not to try. They're reasons to be bold, together, to establish a shared understanding that's taken for granted in medicine. That we can and we must get better. And that it's everyone's job to make it happen. I'm standing here today because so many people were passionate about supporting kids like me. The teacher who opened my mind to new ideas and showed me what was possible. The administrators who gave me a safe and healthy place to learn. The people outside the school system who pushed it to be the best it could be. In other words, I'm standing here today because people like you were in my corner. So from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you. Our kids and our country are better for the work that you do. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Director of the Mind, Brain, and Education Program, Harvard University, and President of Populous, Todd Rose. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so uh, we've um, known each other for a few years. Mm -hmm. um, I like to say it was uh, before CZI was CZI, startup education. It's true. Um, one of the things that was so fascinating to me listening uh, to your remarks is just how far the work has come. I know it may not feel that way, you know, to you in the work, but and, and in particular, how far your thinking has come. So, you know, we've got, you know, 13 minutes or so. Um, and I thought what I'd use this time is just ask a few questions, uh, largely around building on the remarks you made, uh, sort of thinking about some of the choices you made and why you made them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I want to start, like, your remarks and, and here and in other places really center on kids, on children, yep. their needs. Um, and, you know, you've had, you've been around, whether you're a tutor, uh, you started a school, and you have children of your own. Mm -hmm. So I want to start by th this question, which is one of my favorite questions, is because I'm always interested in how people respond, is like, what surprises you about children? Kids are each so different. I know that's what you expect me to say, because I talked about personalized learning. Um, but I, 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 um, I've spent a lot of time working with kids. And I actually, uh, I still have a reading group. I read with a bunch of four-year-olds at the primary school every Wednesday morning. And uh, you always have some trouble engaging all the kids at the same time. And there's maybe one kid who's running off not wanting to do what I, I was planning on doing that morning. And you have to ask the question of why. Um, because oftentimes we jump to the action, like ask a question, put him next, sit him next to you, but we don't take the step back to ask why is that student doing that? And the reasons in my experience are vastly, have a vast range of possible answers. The material's too basic, not in interested, didn't sleep at all last night, um, ADHD, hungry, we don't know, and until we actually ask why and develop a better understanding and relationship with the student, what we do may not actually get the kid to actually engage in what we want, get them to draw them back into the circle. And um, asking why is so important because kids only have so many ways of expressing themselves, and so the end pathway for all different types of issues can look the same 
and have dramatically different reasons for why. So let's build on that. Okay, so to me that suggests the sort of logical need for something like some form of personalization, right? We're not going to treat every kid the same. Um, and that makes me think about, you know, you mentioned Summit Learning, which I know is a really big investment on the part of CZI um, to bring that kind of model to scale. So um, I know you already said a few things, but for people that don't know, maybe just expand, like, I'd like to know a little bit, like, how's it going, right? Mm -hmm. You mentioned almost in almost 400 schools. Um, and what are you most proud of so far with it? I think uh, Summit Learning, uh, uh, we've built in collaboration with Summit Public Schools, and uh, it's really taken their pedagogical approach of how do you actually personalize learning. So there's three components, the projects, the mentorship, and the self-directed learning. <clears throat> and the thing that's been so exciting and promising in, the, uh, in our, the strong implementations is that you can, you walk into a classroom and you almost don't, you don't recognize it. And, you know, I, one thing that drives me nuts is like personalized learning, kids behind computers. That's not what it is. And what uh, one school leader said is like, you walk in and you can hear it. Like, before you see what personalized learning is, you hear it. Because kids are asking questions, driving their own learning, working in small groups. And it's not one teacher's voice, it's everyone's voice really working together in the classroom. And you never know what you to really expect. Um, so that's, I think that's not quantifiable, um, that piece around self-direction, purpose, um, uh, wanting to... Uh, really understand the why and drive your learning and see it in the real world. And that's the work that we're excited to be complementing at CZI. It's like, what is that tra developmental trajectory of what purpose looks like over a child's life? How do we know what it should look like and how to help teachers have tools to nudge it in either way? Um, and so that's the, the, the part that we don't know how to quantify yet is the part that's the most exciting about what is happening in the yeah. Summit Learning Schools. It reminds me, the first time I ever went into one of the schools, which is a proper Summit school, the thing that I took away was the, the confidence. And it's like, it's, it's like, what do you do with that? You can't quantify it, but it was like, you could tell, right? Yeah. Something about it. Um, in that same vein then, okay, at the end of the day, this is, it is software in addition to a, a curriculum and other things. Like, what has been sort of the biggest obstacle or obstacles to getting this implemented in, in schools? So an, an important saying that we have at CZI is that technology is not the silver bullet. Um, at CZI, we're a philanthropy where we build technology and advocacy and we do grant making. But we know that is in a very specific niche. And the part that is hard is not building the software. You can build software in isolation anywhere. That's not hard. The part that's actually hard is really listening, getting a good sense of what teachers and school leaders are asking for, and also the professional development that needs to come along with this. Because it is a new way of thinking about the student. It is a new way of thinking about the classroom, and really making sure that um, that, that uh, component of teaching and learning, the professional development that prepares the educator for this, is in the right place is the part that, um, uh, you know, but not what we do, um, it's what Summit does, but also that's the part that um, we need to continue working okay. on. Okay, I'm gonna stick on the theme of obstacles, mm -hmm. positive um, subject. Um, when I hear your remarks and the vision you are painting for a future of education, one that's about a whole child, it's about um, taking luck out of the equation, it's about, um, allowing every child to realize their full potential, right? Mm -hmm. That's not unambitious, right? Um, and, you know, it's a pretty big transformative view for uh, education. So, again, on the theme of obstacles, I want to think about, like, what are the obstacles then, right, to realizing that vision? Because I think everyone in this room, I, I doubt there's many people who would say, we don't want that. So where do you see the obstacles lying for us getting there as a country? I think we have to actually expand our definition of success, and that's going to be hard. That's actually a transformative change, because right now we are all running to, uh, and it's table stakes, right? You have to get into college. What are the academic um, outcomes that you need? What are the standardized test results that you need? 
But if we don't actually embrace a broader definition of success, resilience, purpose, um, identity, uh, uh, executive function, all these other components that we know are important in actually persevering in, uh, in college and having success later in life, we won't be oriented. We, if we don't have that as a North Star, we can't run towards it. And we won't actually be able to set up our systems in the way we educate children to reach that definition of success. And I think there's a lot that we need to do there, both like we can't end in a state where it's like, well, you just, you feel it. Right. That's not good enough. Um, because if we're asking people to make real substantive change, we need to know what it is and why it's important. And so there's a lot more work to get there. But I think if we all retired in our careers with, um, with an eye towards a path to that broader definition of success, that would be... Um, a goal worth working towards. So if we have a, a more expanded view of success, you think that's a, a primary, we've got to get to there, as a, get over this first obstacle to mm -hmm. be able to transform systems. Um, you've hit on this both in your remarks and then in, in some of the comments here around technology, mm -hmm. um, but I want to ask this anyway, uh, because in, in some ways, no matter what else we say, there, probably nobody in this audience, but there are plenty of people who, like when we say we know that we need technology to do this kind of personalization at scale. There's no yeah. way around that. Um, but when they hear that, they often think well, it's about giving kids a laptop or an iPad at best, or at worst, it really is kids sitting in front of a computer in isolation. Yeah. Again, I know you've mentioned this, but I just want to hear, like, how do you, like, in the, what is your view of the role of technology then for this? Yeah, I think right now our conversation about screen time needs to get more nuanced. I completely agree with you. We cannot have computers like babysitting students. They can't just be passing time there. That is not what time in school should be about. Uh, and at the same time, we need to figure out what are the pieces that actually enhance the adult relationship. Um, what, what can we do to tee up a student and a, an adult, a teacher, to actually have a more enriching in-person um, experience, a more in, uh, a deeply meaningful exchange. And that may be uh, what I was talking about before, sort of like a simple note and reminder system, like this is what you talked about last with this mentee. But it could be knowing like, oh, that's funny, you only do your math, uh, this type of math problem, why not this? Um, and to really get beyond what um, can be done independently um, and get a teacher to engage on problem solving and nudging the kid in the right next direction. I think that's what, where we want to get to and uh, like, we all have uh, room to improve there, but that is the North Star of using uh, how we want to think about using technology in the classroom. Um, okay, so Again, back, let's go back to this big vision that I think most people would embrace about what we want the purpose of education to be. I'm going to flash forward a little bit because let's think about what success would actually look like, right? At sort of like the system level, but also like at the child level. Like, if you get your vision, what does it look like? I think it means that we have kids and new generations that are, can grow. They're adaptable. They are ready for new, ver new versions of the world because they know how to learn, they understand um, themselves, they understand how to feel fulfilled in dimensions that are more than just the simple um, one-dimensional axis that we think about in terms of definitions of success. And um, I think that's exciting. So, I'm lucky I, get, I have two minutes left. So okay. I'm, I'm gonna ask you one that I've always, okay. So we both have kids. Yep. Uh, my kids are actually done with college. Uh, you're, yeah, it's getting. Yeah, this, um, you, it always confuses me, confuses me when you say yeah, that. It, you, when you get married when you're 19, that, that's what happens. But um, the, uh, just don't take life advice from me is what yeah. I'm trying to say. Um, <laughs> but uh, when I was looking at schools, when I was thinking about school, it wasn't that long ago, but like what I looked for for quality was pretty, narrow, right? It was like traditional, what we think of, like 
how many AP classes, what it's, you know, SAT scores, colleges. Um, the world you're talking about, the schools you're talking about, you're, you're talking about something very different, right? So I think about it, we're going to need parents to know what it is they're asking for. I wonder just a little bit, like, what should they be looking for? And, and, and maybe even specifically, eventually you're going to have to think about this. What are you going to look for for your kids? Um, I actually have a very simple question that I look for for um, my girls. I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And I actually look for in the school that uh, I started the primary school. Does the school believe your voice is important? Is what you say valued? Doesn't matter if you're one or 17. Does the teacher actually hang on to your, of what your idea is or what you say as critically important because it can change the world? Um, that's uh, non-tangible, I'm sorry. Um, but I want to look for that because I think more than teaching kids if their math and reading and letters is, are you important? And is your voice going to be heard in this world? Um, and so that's my North Star for my kids and all the other kids that I work with and feel responsible for. Oh, yeah. All right, well, look, we're right at zero. So thank you so much. It was great talking to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.